was the big two-syllable word that everybody was talking about and trying to understand. It's a method of, of transmitting money. That's a very effective way of transmitting money, and you can do it anonymously and all that. A check is a way of transmitting money, too. Our checks are worth a whole lot of money just because they can transmit money. Our money orders, you can transmit money by money orders. People do it. I hope Bitcoin becomes a better way of doing it, but you can replicate it a bunch of different ways, and it will be. And the idea that it has some huge intrinsic value is just a joke, in my view. Bitcoin is worthless artificial gold, which if it succeeded would facilitate a lot of illicit activity. Now that is not something I think the world needs. And the fact that it's clever computer science doesn't mean that it should be widely used and that respectable people should encourage other people to speculate on it. Bitcoin reminds me of Oscar Wilde's definition of fox hunting the pursuit of the uneatable by the unspeakable. Facebook has a long list of scandals, including its repeated failures to safeguard its users' data. Uh, the only thing that he said uh, that I agree with is that he will not launch Libra until the regulatory agencies say that they're ready to give some oversight to it and give some of the word go. President Trump is a big fan of low interest rates. Frankly, if we ever got interest rates down where they should be, and if they weren't raised so fast, uh, you would see another probably 10,000 points on the Dow. The Fed acted too soon. I turned out to be right. They acted too soon and too violent. Can you characterize everything that the Fed has done this past week as essentially flooding the system with money? Yes, exactly. And there's no end to your ability to do that? There is no end to our ability to do that. Is the Fed just going to print money? That's literally what Congress has told us to do. That's the authority that they've given us. I could care less about Bitcoin. I don't, know why I, I don't know why I said anything about it. The blockchain is a technology, which is a good technology. We actually use it. It will be used for a lot of different things. God bless the blockchain. Cryptocurrencies and digital currencies, you know, I think, are also fine. You know, JP Moore moves $6 trillion around the world every day. We don't do it in cash. It's done digitally. Uh, Mr. Diamond, in 2017, you called cryptocurrencies, quote, not a real thing. But this year, your firm... Uh, unveiled JPM coin and stated, quote, we are supportive of cryptocurrencies as long as they are properly controlled and regulated. Why the shift? So the blockchain is real. It's a technology. A lot of people use it and testing it today, and we think it will work over time. Uh, but, I, but the part that's not real is the cryptocurrency is not supported by anything. So the debate is uh, Bitcoin versus gold. I think that all gold holders and all Bitcoin holders agree on sound money principles. And the real debate is which is the best monetary system in order to pursue the ideals of sound money. Doing, you're doing great. Keep keep going. You got good you got good energy. You got a good group of people here. So um, just wanted to uh, let you know that like the team is behind all of you guys. You know the team's behind all the gamers. And yeah, just. Uh, want to come in and uh, and say hi. That's so nice of you. Aluminum, you've got silicon. You can't build a computer without silicon. You can't build a skyscraper without steel. Uh, you're not going to survive if you don't pick the right element. a Bitcoin mine hidden deep in the mountains of Sichuan in China. And its rival is on the other side of the planet, at a former factory that used to make denim for Levi's. These two miners make money by providing the massive computing power that's required to process and record a high volume of cryptocurrency transactions. Business was soaring as Bitcoin hit new highs in early 2021. Chapter 1 what is Bitcoin? 
a blockchain success. I think the, the blockchain technology as a whole, um, for record keeping and for instant settlement and just globalization of currencies. Like there, there's just, there's so many different things. For me, the biggest thing is uh, the disruption of the security markets. Just any transaction that has a third party or needs a third party as a trusted entity in the middle uh, can be completely replaced with blockchain and with cryptocurrencies. And you know, so there, there are just so many possibilities. What are you looking at there, man? I'm just finishing up some analysis. Buddy, it's 2018. You don't have any crypto yet? This is the way of the future, man. But isn't it just like some type of Ponzi scheme? Are you kidding me? This is gonna be the gold of the future. What do you mean virtual gold? Yeah, store wealth is huge. Um, just the trade between individuals anywhere in the world instantly without borders is, is a huge thing. Blockchain is now most commonly known because of Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency. But blockchain is the underlying programming infrastructure on top of which cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin have been developed. Bitcoin was developed using SHA-256 security. Bitcoin is a, at this phase, given the low processing power of the network, um, Bitcoin is a uh, electronic store of value, which is has very, very high security uh, via its, its, its uh, encryption. Bitcoin, to me, has the prospect of becoming the dominant currency of the digital world. With Bitcoin, using Secure Hash Algorithm 2 makes it equivalent to one big, super secure Excel spreadsheet running on a decentralized network of computers. It's like a bank ledger in the sky that no one can hack. SHA-256 is one of the successor hash functions to SHA-1, collectively referred to as SHA-2, and is one of the strongest hash functions available. The 256-bit key makes it a good partner function for AES. The standard bank-level encryption is 256-bit AES, or Advanced Encryption Standard, so we know we are in secure hands using a 256-bit standard with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's a way of quite simply communicating value from one person to another. The difference here is that there's no Federal Reserve or intermediary sitting in between the transaction. It's what's called a decentralized network, meaning that it's governed and run and controlled by people that participate in the network. The incredible thing is that I could send a transaction from here in sunny Australia all the way over to somewhere in the US as an example, and there's no intermediary sitting in between to facilitate the transaction and the settlement is instantaneous, which is absolutely incredible. And it's all built upon a blockchain, which is very unique. And that is what keeps the network secure and processes the transactions. You can think of Bitcoin as a digital ledger where anyone and everyone can record transactions, but none of the values of those transactions can be changed without everyone else being aware. Today, we're gonna to be telling you something that people believe about Bitcoin that's absolutely not true. This is the biggest myth that people believe about Bitcoin. They said the same thing. They said, and it's untraceable. There's this idea that Bitcoin is not traceable. Only those who own Bitcoin and trade it over the blockchain network from person to person can take part in these changes in the open ledger. Because of that, Bitcoin is known as unhackable, although some other cryptocurrency technologies have been hacked in recent years. Tanya and Jared Vitovic discovered cryptocurrency through Tanya's co-worker a few years ago. So the Florida couple started buying Bitcoin and Ethereum using Coinbase, the largest U.S. cryptocurrency exchange. But earlier this year, the Vitovics say their account was hacked. Their investment, which had grown from a total of about $45,000 to some $168,000, was essentially wiped out. Exchanges and wallets can be hacked. Bitcoin has not, though. And the value of having an underlying platform that is available for everyone to see and that is known to be secure is pretty obvious. Did you hear about that guy who bought a pizza with Bitcoin like in 2014? I did hear about that guy. Yeah, if you kept that today, you'd be worth like over a million dollars. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Could you imagine being that guy? I hope that pizza tasted good, don't you? You know, you eat every single bite of that slice. Oh. Crypto is about ownership. You are your own bank. One of the most common questions people ask me is, what is the best way to store my crypto? This is not a topic we take lightly. Unfortunately, whenever there's money on the table, there will always be desperate people out there who are willing to steal it. 
This industry is worth over $2.6 trillion. With that much on the line, you should take every precaution and do everything in your power to protect your piece of the pie. The best way to prevent any of this from happening to you is to purchase a cold storage hardware wallet. Cold storage means it's completely offline. Consequently, impossible to hack into through a server. So when it comes to the safety side of things, the psychology is what is really more important. So think of it as building a house. If you've got solid foundations on your house, you're happy to build higher. But if you know you've got weak foundations, you do not want to build higher. And that is the importance of safety. It is your base foundation and your base pillar. So when it does come to safety, there's many different ways to store. Cryptocurrency on the exchange is a no-no. Pull it offline in your own possession. There's software wallets which are connected to the internet, which again, I am a little bit questionable around because uh, they are susceptible to being hacked because they're still connected to uh, the internet. The safest way is definitely hardware wallets. Uh, Ledger devices are one of the most common, Trezor as well. I personally prefer Ledger. Now, where most people go wrong is they think, okay, great, I'll go out and buy a Ledger device and I'll chuck my crypto on there and I'll be good to go. When you set up the device, you're given what's called a recovery phrase. This is a combination of 24 words and it's unique to you and your device and your part of the blockchain. Think of that as your front door key. What's really important is that you manage multiple copies of that front door key, but you're able to access it anywhere in the world at any point in time. Most people unfortunately write it down on a bit of paper. Paper burns, paper turns to paper mache in a flood. It can get lost, it can get stolen. It's no good and you're fireproof safe at home if you're on holiday on the other side of the world. And also, if you pass away, you want to know that you've transferred all those details to someone else. But maybe you don't want to give them access right now because you don't necessarily feel comfortable doing that. So you can set up time, relock, time lock release digital vaults uh, which are encrypted, and that gives you access anywhere in the world at any point in time, but also you can pass that data over to someone else without actually giving them access. So secure your foundation, and then you'll be able to build more than the house, maybe a hotel on top. That means blockchain, in all its various uses, allows for the removal of corruptible middlemen from various transactions. And more cost effective for people to trade. Madoff was someone who was very much in the thick of things on Wall Street and generally respected. No more shady brokers or con men are stealing money on the blockchain. It is simply a tangibly high value technology that replaces the traditional banking systems with each coin that is created on the blockchain. That's why the traditional banking system was originally so scared of it becoming more credible or popular in its early days of fame. He said, uh, in trading in cryptocurrency, it's like dealing with freshly harvested baby brains. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people can say whatever they want. I think, um, you know, the, the, someone on Twitter says, yes, it's rat poison, but the rat is actually the banking system. Uh, so all of the incumbents are, you know, worried about what this, what will this mean? I think, for me, it's it's all about inevitability of the progress of technology. To me, uh, nation states and uh, banks and everyone will move to cryptocurrencies because it will allow so much efficiency to occur. I mean, if I can if I can buy and sell goods with uh, between two counterparties and I do not need any intermediaries to settle that, and I do not need to send an invoice and we can have the transaction happen and the settlement happen instantaneous, then that will cut out so much cost out of, out of almost anything we do. Um, quantifications, for example, for supply chain are that up to 10% of the cost of supply chain can be, um, can be removed. So on global trade, that's about 1.8 trillion. So, you know, you can do the math. That's, that, those, are, those are staggering numbers that are uh, basically too big not to, go, not to harvest. And that can only be done by really implementing cryptocurrencies and, and going quite far along with that. So then, so then that's, for me, that's the underlying wave of what we're talking about. This, this is talking about Internet 3.0 or the Internet of money or streaming money or having that interaction with a digital good that allows for the next evolution of, of, of digital trade. So, so, so having said that, 
then we can have a discussion about the, the current cryptocurrencies and, and, and where is that going to go. This is footage from the 2016 Davos conference where bankers noticed Bitcoin's global popularity. Maybe, just maybe, makes the bankers suddenly very fond of the regulators because guess what? Maybe they're going to protect them from the new disruptive forces. I mean, I made some money off of it, but how much money are you really making? Um, I mean, I don't like, I don't like getting into numbers exactly, right? Basically, I invested a, a thousand bucks, you know, just see what happens. Um, and that's, that's 50,000 now, so. I don't like to get numbers though, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, I made $58,000. Really? Uh, Cryptocurrency is a game changer, and banks hate when the game changes, especially if it's in your favor. This is footage where Warren Buffett comments on cryptocurrencies. That's one kind of game that is not investing. Uh, more like Rat Poison Squared. Yeah, so right now I'm heading over to the print shop, uh, getting this sign laminated. Um, so when I'm uh, street performing on the street, uh, turntablism, I'm able to accept your favorite cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is a decentralized digital currency without a central bank or single administrator that can be sent from user to user on the peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin network without the need for intermediaries. Transactions are verified by network nodes through cryptography and recorded in a public distributed ledger called a blockchain. Decentralized currency, a bunch of people were pissed off after the 2008 financial crisis. They said, you know what, these governments. And then some Japanese dude that will never track down invented blockchain, which allows for decentralization of cryptocurrencies. The cryptocurrency Bitcoin was invented in 2008 by an unknown person or group of people using the name Satoshi Nakamoto. If you rearrange the letters in Satoshi Nakamoto, it does spell out hidden Adam, ask Sue, but that doesn't mean anything. We still don't know who designed Bitcoin. I invented Bitcoin back in um, 2008, 2009. You I released it. That's, yes. I mean, I you, released you are Satoshi. I am, I've said that already. I'm going to court about that one. Uh, <laughs> the whole idea was about micropayments. It's about a system that enables commercial internet use. Yeah. It enables you to have rapid, fast settlement, um, secure systems, many other things. It was never a store of gold. My name's Craig Wright and I'm about to demonstrate um, a signing of a message with the public key that is associated with um, the first transaction ever done on Bitcoin. And who does the world think did that first transaction? What's the name associated with that first transaction? The monkeyer is Satoshi Nakamoto. So you're going to show me that Satoshi Nakamoto is you? Yes. Some people will believe, some people won't. And to tell you the truth, I don't really care. Care. The currency began being used in 2009 when its implementation was released as an open source software. One of the biggest differences between traditional currency and cryptocurrency is this complete lack of a centralized accounting system. There is no central authority, no boss, and no management of the blockchain. It's a free market where you are your own boss. It's like all those internet ads about working from home, only it's real. Bitcoin is policed by its own infallible programming on the blockchain itself, and of course, by the community who own it. As people purchase Bitcoin, they become stakeholders and developers who must own Bitcoin to build on top of or upgrade its technology. This is William Wang. He saw firsthand cryptocurrency sales booming in China and had the clever idea to facilitate sales of cryptocurrency to Chinese citizens in Canada with his very own exchange called Coin Season. His services facilitated some capital flight out of China into other markets around the world via cryptocurrency sales to his clients. Tell me about uh, what most people are doing here. We have 10 people working as our IT department. They are most uh, developers. They have 40 experience. How much, how much money in uh, business does your your company trade in? Let's say per month. Per month. Yeah. Uh, around uh, 20 million, 20 million US dollars. Yeah, because um. The cryptocurrency market in China is growing very, very fast since the 2012. And during the last 
It's actually last year, 2017, the Chinese government just banned the ICO and banned the cryptocurrency exchange platforms. So for now, people cannot register a company in China like I'm doing a cryptocurrency exchange. But in China, people can still buy and sell Bitcoin. People can still run in a mining companies. It's allowed. Um, but people when try to sell it, it only can go through, a, it's called OTC over the counter. So people can only private sell, okay, I have Bitcoins, I want to sell some, I want to sell to other people. So I will just put an advertisement anywhere. Like people get interested, I want to buy, okay, just, just okay, you want to sell, I want to buy, let's make a deal. How much you, to cost to buy your Bitcoins. So it's called over the counter, not, go, not go through from the marketplace. Thus the community has grown by intelligent, like-minded individuals, while their wealth grows in turn due to the rising value of Bitcoin. Bitcoin owners are steering Bitcoin and helping other Bitcoin owners, so people who join the market have all the advantages of the top earners. It'd be like if you and Elon Musk had the same financial advisor, only you don't have to pay them because Elon is footing the bill. So what makes Bitcoin's value rise so much? Simply supply and demand. And of course, first to market advantages. There originally was supposed to only ever be 21 million Bitcoin in circulation. However, that number has now shrunk because over the years, large portions of Bitcoin have been lost by wallet holders who passed away without sharing their password information. People lose coins all the time, only in this case it makes the remaining coins more valuable. It's like if your friend lost a quarter, so now the quarter you own is worth 30 cents. So 23% is the number of Bitcoins right now that have either been lost or mismanaged, which is, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, and no doubt in the future that will probably be trillions of dollars. Now, what happens is people are losing equivalent to that front door key, you might say, and unfortunately they haven't made a copy of that. So they can see what's inside the house, you can see what's on the blockchain, but you just can't unlock it to regain access, which is a really scary reality. There's some incredible stories. So there's a guy in the UK, uh, seven and a half thousand Bitcoin uh, he had on his hard drive, which he threw in a dump site, and he's been trying to buy the dump site for years, unfortunately. Uh, Quadrica CX is a Canadian exchange where somehow the owner was the only one that uh, had access to everything, and he died in a, a quick event and uh, no one else was able to access it. And we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of all the clients that were using the exchange, they lost access instantly. What you're seeing here is an image of 18 million Bitcoin. Therefore, with 7.753 billion people on the planet and only 18 million Bitcoin up for grabs, that creates high demand if more and more people decide to own it. This limited supply has allowed Bitcoin to be deemed a deflationary currency. So right now, people can't really see what gives Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies the value and what makes it maintain its market rate. Simple supply and demand. People want cryptocurrency. And, and it's not just restricted by one country, it's the global demand. And so something like the US dollar is backed by the US government, the GDP of, the, of that country. And with cryptocurrencies, they're backed by the global GDP, essentially, because it, it's opening up to the, the demand of anybody around the world. So, like right now, we, we've got a flood of fiat currency into digital currencies. And, and I really think that that could be the catalyst of taking cryptocurrencies or digital currencies, whether it's Bitcoin or another one, into the mainstream, and it could be, even become the global reserve currency. Over the last few hundred years, there's been several different res global reserve currencies. It was France, then Britain, and then the United States. And these cycles, it, like the reserve currencies usually last about 100 years. And it, I think it makes sense for the next global reserve currency to be a true global currency. And, and that would be a cryptocurrency or a digital currency. There's no question in my mind, it has never been a question in my mind, the cryptocurrency will replace our entire financial system. Uh, that's part of the reason why I got into all this. Uh, it's so hot and heavy is because it's so obvious that one day we're not gonna be trading paper money. Everything will be digital. Cryptocurrency, blockchain is the only thing that makes sense right now. And I think we'll see that you know, for a long time to come. In terms of the world reserve currency, 
we will see that replaced. The average amount of years is about 90 years if you go back to the first reserve currency, which was from Portugal, uh, I think in the 14 or 1500s. Every 90 years that's changed. Right now, we're about 90 years for the United States dollar uh, being the world reserve currency. So it will be changing very soon. Now, will that be Bitcoin or will we have some kind of transition? I think that's the more important question. In my mind, I think it is possible it could be Bitcoin, but also a CBDC, a central bank digital currency, could kind of get us uh, in the middle between where we're at right now and Bitcoin. You don't have to own one whole Bitcoin either. You can own a fraction of a Bitcoin, up to eight decimal places, or 100 millionth of a single Bitcoin. These parts, or smaller fractions of a Bitcoin, are called Satoshis in honor of their creator. Again, we don't know who that is, so if you're the real Satoshi Nakamoto, please stand up. As Bitcoin charted a new decentralized currency landscape in the world, new technologies that work like Bitcoin have sprung up around the world to challenge its market dominance. Take this chart for example. This shows all the other cryptocurrencies, utility tokens, Ethereum tokens, smart contract coins, DeFi coins, interoperable bridge coins for smart contract networks, and of course, Oracle coins for bridging data from the traditional internet to the new internet web 3.0.